Welcome, this is Terry Ewell, and I'm pleased that we are back to continue our interview with Professor Jonathan Leshnoff. So I know, I know early in your career you were influenced by Stephen Albert. Yes. Uh, you know, well-published American composer. Uh, does that influence continue today? Absolutely. Mm. Uh, the influence that Albert's music had on me was his insistence that the 20th century, because um, he died at the end of the 20th century, but 20th century music had lost its concept of harmony. I said, why has harmony gone? There have been wonderful creative things that have happened in the 20th century, but why was harmony jettisoned in 1945, essentially, or thereabouts? And so he uh, created his own harmonic system, his own harmonic world. I was fortunate to know him just a year before he died and to hear from his own mouth about mm. his harmonic system and how he found proof from it, from repertoire from the era's past. So my early works uh, have a harmonic resemblance to him, I mean early, early stuff. Since then I've diverged uh, from his area of harmonic thinking in terms of the technical aspects, but in terms of believing that music should have a harmonic component in, additional, in addition to form and counterpoint and this and that, my, I fervently believe that, so even to this day I feel very, very connected to him and grateful to him hmm. for that. Where did you first meet him? Uh, in the 1990s, I met him at Peabody okay. when I was a student there. They had a, uh, a thing back then, at least, where they would bring in a Pulitzer Prize winning composer, specifically a Pulitzer Prize, every year to uh, not only give a lecture to, but to uh, work with the students, give master class, the performance of the composition. And there's some very notable composers who came through, and Albert was one of them. And I, I heard him, and I, he came from I went after, you know, I went after him and spoke with him, and, and we were just beginning at the beginning of a relationship uh, point. He gave me his home phone number, and then he died tragically mm. in a car accident on, mm. on the way to Cape Cod. And everything since then has just been what I've gleaned from his lectures, studying his works. Okay. I've, Are these lectures published? No, mm -hmm. just the lectures that uh, that I heard from Peabody. He was working on a. Um, uh, a thesis, a, a publication, proving his harmonic theory uh, from you know from Giswaldo <laughs> to oh, like okay. to, you know to, to list through Beethoven through uh, Bartok and Stravinsky, uh, and he his widow had those manuscripts. I think actually those manuscripts are now at the University of Maryland. Uh, so you've given me a little preview of the concerto, which I appreciate. Thank you. Sure. And I've heard a little bit of the second and third movement. And what struck me the most, Jonathan, was the rhythmic vitality that seemed to depart a bit uh, from maybe some of your earlier compositions. I, I don't know if that was me, but I've, I've been a part of the uh, Baltimore Chamber Orchestra that recorded your violin concerto. I've heard many of your other, other compositions, uh, particularly your choral works are quite different in mood than this. Uh, could you comment on that? And, and is my observation of any val validity? Oh, it's quite valid. It, as I get older and do this more and more. I found something very interesting in rhythm. Known to everyone but me, so I think it's a discovery. But I found uh, something that interests me is that if I keep a steady meter, especially in, in bigger meters like 4 2 or 3 2, and then I start placing accents within this steady meter. I find very interesting hops and mm. bubbles that come out. Yeah. So in other words, if I keep this this meter moving along and I kind of start adding these sub-meters or sub-groupings on what's going on, uh, I find that's really exciting. So I think my music has evolved to working with that, where now I'm consciously working with oh, that, okay. finding out what patterns of smaller figures fit within these larger and different, uh, different numbers and patterns and whatnot. I think the audience is going to love it. I just, I, I love the way that worked that, in there. As long as they're all rocking along, yeah. I'm happy. <laughs>
So tell me about some of the most memorable uh, moments that are in the concerto. So two come to mind. One of them uh, is more bassoon-centric, okay. so I'll share that one with you. There's, there's also a clarinet-centric one, but because of you, Terry, <laughs> okay. I'll explain the bassoon one. Uh, the second movement, it's a fun movement. It's comical. It's, it's short. It's not long, but it's kind of like a, 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 a drunken waltz in a sense. Okay. You can imagine like a bear you know, <laughs> tripping on some stones as it's looking for, for some honey. Uh, and uh, the bassoon is the one who's leading off this, this, uh, um, this escapade. So there's a, a kind of a, a, a tilted melody that starts off in the bassoon, which makes good use of the low, rumbly register, and kind of jumps around and moves in different places. And the clarinet picks up. Again, it's not a long movement uh, purposely, but towards the end, I bring that melody back. And of course, uh, not just with one bassoon, but I add the orchestral bassoon, uh, bassoons, and even the contra bassoon. Okay. <laughs> so I have three, with the soloist, who knows how many, three, four bassoons all playing around. All moving around. We love it. Stuff. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so that I, I'm looking forward to that because you know when you write this stuff, you've got to have a little sense of humor. I mean, the first movement's very serious. Okay. And third movement, as you pointed out, very rhythmic and, and, and has a lot of energy and hops in it. But uh, the second one is just plain fun. <laughs> uh, the second uh, uh, area that just comes to mind as like a, a memorable moment is uh, in the third movement, and it's an interplay between the clarinet and the bassoon. And I, there are these ascending scales, very quick. And they, and they, they land on a, a, a sustained note. Okay. So the clarinet goes, and the bassoon quickly follows. And then this continues on and on in a chain. And then I, I crop the rhythmic uh, space between them until they kind of just cycle around. I put the bassoon in the higher register here and the clarinet in the mid register okay. so there'd be some semblance of balance. Of course, I have to carefully orchestrate it because as of today, it's really easy to do it as a But I have to be very careful not to cover the bassoon. And uh, we will see if that can be done. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <I hope so. laughs>